morning. morning. Wonderful. Let's begin by saying we are living through a very dangerous time. Look no further than the banning of books or black history in Florida. Everyone in this room, in one way or another, is aware of that. We are in a revolutionary situation, no matter how unpopular that word has become in this country. The society in which we live in is desperately menaced, not by Putin, but from within. To any citizen of this country who figures himself as responsible, and particularly those of you who deal with the minds and hearts of young people, must be prepared to go for broke. Or to put it another way, you must understand that in the attempt to correct so many generations of bad faith and cruelty, when it is operating not only in the classroom, but in society, you will meet the most fantastic, the most brutal, and the most determined resistance. There is no point in pretending that this won't happen. Since I'm talking amongst mostly white school teachers, in some ways I'm fairly easily intimidated. I beg you to let me leave that and go back to what I think to be the entire purpose of education in the first place. It would seem to me that when a child is born, if I'm the child's parent, it is my obligation and my high duty to civilize that child. Humans are social animals. We cannot exist without a society. A society in turn depends on certain things which everyone within that society takes for granted. Now the crucial paradox which confronts us here is that the whole process of education occurs within the social framework and is designed to perpetuate the aims of that society. The paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which they are being educated. The purpose of education, finally, is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for themselves, to make their own decisions, to say to themselves that this is black or this is white, to decide for themselves whether there is a God in heaven or not, to ask questions of the universe, and then to live with those questions is the way they achieve their own identity. But no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. No society, or sorry, what societies really ideally want is citizenry, which will simply obey the rules of society. If society succeeds in this, that society is about to perish. The obligation of anyone who thinks themselves as responsible is to examine society and to try to change it and fight it no matter the risk. This is the only hope that society has. This is the only way societies change. Now, if what I've tried to sketch has any validity, it becomes thoroughly clear, at least to me, that any black person who was born in this country undergoes the American educational system, runs the risk of becoming schizophrenic. On the one hand, he is born in the shadows of stars and stripes, and he is assured it represents a nation which has never lost a war. He pledges allegiance to that flag, which guarantees liberty and justice for all. He is part of a country which anyone can become president, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, he is also assured by his country and by his countrymen that he has never contributed anything to civilization. And that past has nothing more than a record of humiliations gladly endured. Pardon me, I need a tissue. Oh, right here, thank you kindly. Appreciate you. He is assumed by, by the Republic that he, his father, his mother, and his ancestors were happy, shiftless, watermelon-eating darkies, and that the value he has as a black man is proven by only one thing, his devotion to white folks. If you think I'm exaggerating, examine the myths, which pro, uh, pardon me, examine the myths which proliferate in this country about black people. Scroll through your TikToks, scroll through your IGs. All this enters into a child's consciousness much sooner than we as adults would like to think it does. As adults, we are easily fooled because we are so anxious to be fooled. But children are different. Children not yet aware that it is dangerous to look too deeply at anything, look at everything, look at each other and draw their own conclusions. 
They don't have the vocabulary to express what they see, and we, their elders, know how to intimidate them very easily and very soon. But a black child, looking at the world around them, though we cannot know what quite to make of it, is aware that there is a reason why his mother works so hard and why his father is always on edge. He is aware that there is some terrible weight on his parents' shoulders which menaces him. And it isn't long. In fact, it begins when he's in school before he discovers the shape of his oppression. I still remember my first sight in New York. It really was another city when I was born, where I was born. I used to look down over Park Avenue. It was Park Avenue, but I didn't know what Park Avenue meant as actually sort of downtown. The part of New York I grew up in was dark and dirty. No one would ever dream of opening a Tiffany's in my part of the Bronx. And when you go downtown, you discover that you are literally in a white world. It's rich, or at least it looks rich. It's clean, because they collect garbage downtown. They're dormant. People walk about as if they owned where they are, and indeed they do. It's a great shock. It's very hard to relate yourself to this. You don't know what it means. You know, you know instinctively that none of this is for you. You know this before you are told. And who is it for? And who's paying for it? And why isn't it for you? The point of all this is that black men were brought here as a source of cheap labor. They were indispensable to the economy. In order to justify the fact that men were treated as though they were animals, the white republic had to brainwash itself into believing that they were indeed animals and deserved to be treated like animals. Therefore, it is almost impossible for any black child to discover anything about their actual history. The reason is that this animal once he suspects his own worth, once he starts believing that he is man, has began to attack the entire power structure. This is why America has spent such a long time keeping the black man in his place. What I'm trying to suggest to you is that it was not an accident. It was not an act of God. It was not done by well-meaning people muddling into something which they didn't understand. It was deliberate policy hammered into place in order to make money from black flesh. And now, in 2023, we have still yet to face this fact, and we are in tolerable trouble. It is not really Black Lives Matter that is upsetting this country. What is upsetting this country is a sense of its own identity. If, for example, one man is to change the curriculum in all the schools so that black folk learn more about themselves, and their real contributions to this culture, you would be liberating not only black people, you would be liberating white people who know nothing about their own history. You'd be, and the reason is that if you are compelled to lie about one aspect of anybody's history, you must lie about it all. If you have to lie about my real role here, if you have to pretend that I hold cotton just because I love you, then you have done something to yourself. You are mad. What passes for identity in America is a series of myths and one's heroic ancestors. It's astounding to me, for example, that so many people really appear to believe that the country was founded by a band of heroes who wanted to be free. That happens not to be true. What happened was that some people left Europe because they couldn't stay there any longer and had to go someplace else to make it. That's all. They were hungry. They were poor. They were convicts. Those who were making it in England, for example, did not get on the Mayflower. That's how this country was settled. Yet we have a whole race of people, a whole republic, who believe the myths to the point where even today they select political representatives, as far as I can tell, by how closely they resemble themselves. What I'm trying to suggest here is that in the doing of all this for 150 years or more, it is the American white man who has long since lost his grip on reality. In some peculiar way, having created this myth about black people and the myth about their own history, he has created myths about the world. The political level in this country now on the part of people who should know better is abysmal. 
the Bible says somewhere that there is no vision. Pardon me again. The Bible says somewhere that where there is no vision, the people perish. I don't think anyone can doubt that in this country today we are menaced, intolerably menaced, by a lack of vision. It is inconceivable that a sovereign people should continue to say, I can't do anything about it. It's the government. The government is the creation of the people. It is responsible to the people, and the people are responsible for it. No American has the right to allow the, uh, the present government, when black folks are being shot and beaten all over this country, that there's nothing we can do about it. There must have been a day in this country's life when the bombing of the children in Sunday school would have created a public roar. It happened with George Floyd. But since, it continues to happen at a blistering pace. And yet, there still is no public uproar. I begin by saying, Give me one second, sorry. I begin by saying that one of the paradoxes of education was that precisely as the point where you begin to develop a conscious, did I just read that already? Am I crazy? Give me a second. Pardon me, I've lost my way. I begin by saying that one of the paradoxes of education was that precisely as the point when you begin to develop a conscience, you must find yourself at war with your society. It is your responsibility to change that society if you think of yourself as an educated person. And on the basis of evidence, the moral and political evidence, one is compelled to say that this is a backward society. I would try to make each child know that these things are the result of a criminal conspiracy to destroy them. I would teach them that if they intend to get to be a person, they must at once decide that they are stronger than the, cons uh, the conspiracy and that they must never make peace with it. And that one of the weapons for refusing to make peace with it and for destroying it depends on what they decide they are worth. I would teach them that there are currently very few standards in this country which are worth a person's respect. That it is up to them to change these standards for the sake of the life and the health of this country. I would suggest to them that the popular culture as represented, for example, on television or in books or in movies is based on fantasies created by very ill people. And they must be aware that these are fantasies that have nothing to do with reality. I would teach them that the press they read is not as free as it says and that they can do something about that too. I would try to make them know that just as American history is longer, larger, and more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything everyone, anyone has said about it, so is the world larger, more daring, more beautiful, and more terrible, but principally larger, and that it belongs to them. I would teach them that they don't have to be bound by the expediencies of any given administration, any given policy, any given morality, and that they have the right and the necessity to examine everything. America is not the world, and if America is going to become a nation, she must find a way, and this child must help her find a way to use the tremendous potential and tremendous energy which this child represents. If this country does not find a way to use that energy, it will be destroyed by that energy. Is the American dream at the expense of the black man in America, or the American dream is at the expense of black folk? Is the question hideously loaded, and then one's response to that question, one's reaction to that question, has to depend on the effect and in effect where you will find yourself in the world, what your sense of reality is, what your system of reality is. That is, it depends on assumptions which we hold so deeply so as to be scarcely aware of them. In the case of an American black man, in the moment that you are born, since you don't know any better, every stick and stone and every face is white. And since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. 
it comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover the flag which you have pledged allegiance along with everybody else has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and which you owe your life and identity has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. The disaffection, the demoralization, and the gap between one person and another on the basis of the color of their skin begins there and accelerates and accelerates through a whole lifetime. To the present, when you realize you're 30 and you're having a terrible time managing to trust the people around you. You are 40 now and nothing you have done has helped to escape the trap. But what is worse than that is that nothing you have done as far as you can tell, nothing you can do will save your sons or your daughters from meeting the same disaster and not impossibly coming to the same end. I am stating very seriously, and this is not an overstatement, I picked the cotton, I carried it to the market, and I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing, for nothing. We have a civil rights bill now. We're an amendment, the 15th Amendment, nearly 150 years ago. And I hate to sound like an Old Testament prophet. But if the amendment was not honored then, I would have any reason to believe that the civil rights bill would be honored now. If one has got to prove one's title to the land, isn't 400 years enough? 400 years? at least three major wars, and the American soil is full of corpses of my ancestors. Moral lives have been destroyed by the plague called color, that the American sense of reality has been corrupted by it. We talk about integration in America as though it's some great new conundrum. The problem in America is that we've been integrated for a very long time. Put me next to any African from Africa, and you will see what I mean. We are not facing, well, what we are not facing is the result of what we've done. What one brings the American people to do for all of our sakes is to simply accept our history. I was there not only as a slave, but as a concubine. One knows the power, after all, which can be used against another person if you've got absolute power over that person. One of the great things that the white world does not know, but I think do know, is that black people are just like everybody else. One has used the myth of the black person and the myth of color to pretend and assume that you are dealing with, essentially, something exotic or bizarre and practically, according to human laws, unknown. We are human too. We are sitting in this room and we are all, at least I'd like to think we are, relatively civilized. And we can talk to each other, at least on certain levels, that we could walk out of here, out of chapel, assuming that the measure of our enlightenment, or at least our politeness, has some effect on the world. It may not. When, the, uh, uh, when Robert uh, Kennedy was attorney general from 1961 to 1964, he said that it was conceivable that in 40 years in America, we might have a black president. Then that sounded like a very emancipated statement, I suppose, to white people. We've been here for 400 years. And then he tells us then that in 40 years, if you're good, we may let you become president. This is not an act of God. We are dealing with a society made and ruled by men. Had the American black man had not been present in America, I'm convinced the history of the American labor movement would be much more edifying than it is. It is a terrible thing for an entire people to surrender to the notion that one ninth of the population is beneath them. And until that moment, until that moment comes when we, the Americans, we, the American people, are able to accept that fact, I have to accept, for example, that my ancestors were both black and white. I am one of the people who built this country. Until this moment, there is a scarcely any hope for the American dream because the people who are denied participation in it by their very presence will wreck it. 
And if that happens, this is a very grave moment for America. Mrs. Walters talks about, you know, you have to put at the, uh, the bottom of your papers, this is my work. This is not my work, right? I took these words from a collection from James Baldwin. Every night I go to sleep, every night since George Floyd's passing, I've spent time re-examining who I am and what it means to be black in America. And the words that folks have spoken during the Civil Rights Movement still resonate till today. I say these words to you today because they are still wholly relevant. And folks have been saying this for decades and decades and decades. One of the first lines that I wrote in there, or said in here was that to sort of understand who you are in America, right, and to be black in America is to become schizophrenic. The more and more that I learn about who I am and what this country means and my position in it drives me a little bit more crazy every day because folks have been saying the same stuff, using these same words then and now, and still yet, it seems like nothing has changed, or at least change is very, very slow. I combined James Baldwin's pin drop speech, uh, which he used uh, in 1965 at a Cambridge University debate, um, and also uh, another speech he had called A Talk to Teachers, um, uh, that he spoke to teachers at Columbia University in New York City. This James Baldwin quote, and I will leave you this, will always resonate with me every day. And he said, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage almost all the time. For those of you that have known me for my long duration here, I was a, more of a jovial, happier, smilier kind of guy. To know what I know about this country and where we've come from sort of sticks with me. And every day that we don't change, I become a little bit more anxious and a little bit more rageful. Thank you. <laughs>